from Facebook groups to blogs to YouTube channels, you know, just like this one. It seems like a lot of professionals out there in the music industry like to deal in absolutes, like you should never do this or you should always do that. But, you know, I'm not convinced that that's always the best advice. So today I thought it would be a good idea to talk about why we should probably get rid of absolute words like never and always from our own production music vocabulary and how we should approach each contract or cue with flexibility and an open mind. Plus, we'll be taking a listen to an orchestral election coverage cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community, on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast. Uh, first, I do hope that you are doing well, and I want to thank you for spending part of your day here with me. I know you have a lot of options out there, so I want you to know that I really, really do appreciate you. The 52 Cues podcast is a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community, and this week we'll be taking a listen to Results Are In, which is an orchestral election coverage cue, which I believe was written for a taxi brief, written by Jeff Hargrove. So you definitely, definitely want to stick around for that. But before we get started, I have to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Cues who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything you see here going. We are 100% community supported, so if you like what I do here, don't thank me, thank them. And if, if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52 Qs and uh, unlock extra perks like live streams, workshops, interactive feedback, and a ton more, then uh, be sure to click on the links in the description or, you know, stick around because we're going to be talking about all of that a little bit later in today's episode. Before we talk about the topic, I did want to do a quick follow-up. I was on Taxi TV this uh, this past Monday, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes so that you can check out. I really enjoyed talking to Michael Lasko and uh, loved seeing all of the 52 Qs folks hanging out in the chat. I uh, I was able to follow the uh, the, the real time chat later, and uh, it was just really good seeing so many familiar faces and seeing so many new faces. Join We've had, I think, just in the last few days, 20 or 30 new new uh, 52 Qs community members, folks coming over from Taxi and the Taxi forums. And like I said in 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 my interview with with Michael, it's it's not an either or. You don't have to choose. Hey, I'm going to participate in the Taxi forums, or I'm going to participate in the 52 Qs community. You can do you can do both because together together. We are absolutely better. So uh, again, I'll have a link to that interview and a huge thank you to Michael Lasko and all the folks at Taxi for having me. He uh, even invited me to come to the road rally and speak on a panel there. And I'm going to do absolutely everything in my power to uh, to take him up on that offer. So uh, again, thank you very much, Michael, over at Taxi. So I wanted to talk about on today's topic about why production music composers especially should think about getting rid of the terms never and always from our vocabulary and and these are these are concepts that i've seen come up and topics that i've seen come up across you know like perspective forums or other youtubers or whatever blogs articles and it's just not always the case there are so few absolutes in, in this industry and in production music has has its own set of, of of guidelines and principles which govern you know things like copyrights and royalties and all of that. And so when you read something on a forum, you have to kind of translate it into the industry that applies to you. And so what I thought would be a really really helpful idea is to take some of the never and always statements that I've seen show up, and and talk about why maybe they don't necessarily apply to us. One of the big ones I've seen is never give up your publishing share. Never 
give up your publishing share. And in the production music world, I don't know how anyone, any production music composer, hopes to make a living, hopes to get into libraries, hopes to get their music up onto TV if they dig their heels in and insisting on keeping their publishing share. You know, I I have probably 630 or so published cues, and I bet only 15 or 20, maybe 30 of those cues, I don't control the publishing share. Because I have to give up my publishing share to, well, the publishers. All of these libraries, all of these catalogs need the, the, the legal footing to be able to sign your music over into the licensing. And, I'm, and they, they are the ones who are registering to the PROs. They're the ones who are tracking everything. And when something goes sideways, I sure as heck contact my, my publisher to, to help me deal with, hey, what in the world's happening? Why, am I, why did I get 41 cents royalty check? Well, all of that costs money. It costs someone money. It costs somebody their time. And they should be compensated for that. And so we do that as production music composers by giving up our publishing share. And I think where this absolute comes in are, are, are folks coming from the artist background where they're going to put something up on Spotify or, or selling CDs or whatever, and they say, don't ever give up your publishing share. Well, as an artist, maybe you don't, you don't want to give up your publishing share because you have to control where that music gets placed kind of goes hand in hand with never give up your copyright. Again, your library needs that legal footing. And so to just hit every deal you see, every contract you see with never give up your publishing share, never give up your copyright, you're going to have a rough go at it because the libraries need those things to do their jobs, to do the job that you are asking them to do. I've said before here on the channel that your publisher isn't your agent. They don't work for you. They are partners with you in this. They are in the same boat as you are. They're just on a different side. They're rowing on the port side and you're rowing on the starboard side. But you're all rowing and you're all going in the same direction. So if you insist on keeping your publishing share, I imagine most publishers will they won't sign your music. Now, you might be able to get through some royalty-free or some um, non-exclusive publishers, but I am of the belief that non-exclusives will be increasingly rare as content ID and, and TuneSat and all of that, all of those algorithms which help identify music placed in various properties. I imagine as that technology gets more sophisticated, then the the non-exclusive libraries are going to have uh, a, a more difficult time tracking and all of that. So, yeah, don't insist on keeping your publishing share because you severely, severely limit what you can do with your music. And if you insist on keeping your publishing share, just know that now it's up to you. It's up to you to find homes for your music. It's up to you to go sign the deals with all of the networks or the production companies. Now that's on you. And and I sure as heck hope that you have the relationships, let alone the networking and negotiating chops to pull that off. So in production music, you probably will give up your publishing share. And if you see somebody saying never give it up, Make sure that it's apples to apples here, and it's not somebody who wants to be an artist giving somebody who's a production music composer advice. All right, another absolute that I see is always insist on get getting credit. Always insist on getting credit. And this kind of goes hand in hand with never ghostwrite. Now, uh, Anne Catherine Dern, Composer who lives out in LA, who uh, who I'm working on getting an interview with, and so uh, we've communicated, and and I think it's going to happen. We're working on that, just lining up dates. So be on the lookout for that uh, very soon, hopefully in the fall. Anyway, 
her whole YouTube channel is is a lot about kind of unpacking the industry. And she does a, a stellar video on ghostwriting and how it's okay, but it's also some 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 a little bit icky and and and, and all of that. So I'll, I'll I'll link to that video and you can you can check that out. But for that to be an absolute, always insist on getting credit. Well, again, production music composers, good luck with that. Good luck with that. (laughs) You're very rarely going to find your name in the credits at the end of a show. You know, I for production music, I I never see those things. And there's another, (laughs) although asterisks. I did have one placement where I did get credit. Music by, and it was me and two other two other composers who worked on it. So yeah, I got credit there. But always insisting on getting credit if you're doing something, mm, I don't think that's gonna I don't think that's gonna end well for you. And as far as ghostwriting, at this point, we're kind of getting into film music, and and to say never take a ghostwriting gig. Well, I mean, maybe maybe you should, depending on if it's good for your career. And there are so many instances where writing something alongside somebody else, but not getting that credit, not getting that title card or whatever, is just a good career move. I worked on a game gaming project where the game company insisted insisted that there just be one composer credited. For whatever reason, they didn't want music by composer A and composer B. I don't really know the reason behind that, but that's what they wanted. And so they chose the name, which was a little bit more well-known, I guess. And so that's who they went with. So when when it says music by blank, like music by composer A. Composer B got an additional music by credit later, but did not get that music by comp- music composed by. That kind of thing happens all over the place. I mean, go look at like Hans Zimmer's crew over at Remote Control Studio. It's 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 a a and I don't mean this pejoratively. It's it's a factory. Everybody has their part, and everybody's kind of working putting their hands to the piece of the whole picture so that together everybody comes together and makes a good product. But Hans gets his name on the credit. It's no different than like John Williams writing the music at the piano and handing it off to an orchestrator who's going to then hand it off to somebody who's going to engrave it, do all the typesetting, and then Mr. Williams shows up and conducts the orchestra. I mean, it's just a different, it's just a different type of, of, machine. There's a different type of of factory. So always insist on getting credit. Mm, It depends. Never ghostwrite. It depends on if it's good for your career or not. All that having been said, at the end of the day, you need to do what feels right to you. You need to do what's good for your career. Obviously, we we don't want you to get taken advantage of. And I think a good composer is is compensating fairly, and if possible, uh, you know, putting your name like on the team, right? But don't don't approach it as an always situation, because it might be just the shot in the arm you need to to boost your career. I, I keep thinking of uh, Ramin Jawadi, who who was on the remote control team during Pirates of the Caribbean. And when Hans was stuck on a queue, Ramin, who otherwise was just fetching coffee for everybody, wrote a queue that ended up in the movie, and then he's off to the races, and now his career has completely blown up. But you're not going to see music by Ramin Jawadi on the credits for Pirates of the Caribbean. And to be honest, I'm, I'm not even sure his name is at all. I don't want to say that for sure. Maybe somebody in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the comments below can let me know if his name appears at all. I don't know if there are additional music credits. I'm not, I'm not sure. But again, take in each individual situation separately. 
but don't make it an absolute. Always get credit. Never ghostwrite. That's where we get into trouble. Here's, here's another here's an, another absolute statement that I've seen, which deserves consideration. Never work for free. Never give your music away. Never give your cues away. I've even done a whole episode on this. Should we work for free? And the astro- and, and, and the, uh, the answer is, maybe, if it's good for your career, if it, if it gets your foot in the door. Or let's, let's think of it another way. If you're brand new to this, if you're a student, if you've just graduated and you're looking for some film credits, or if you're looking just for the experience of scoring something or writing production music, yeah, you're probably going to give it away because you haven't gathered the experience to insist otherwise. And that's, that's completely okay. Now, in the production music world, we work for free all the time because so much of what we do is on spec, on speculation. And so we only get paid if we get played. And so if I write a ton of cues that never make air, and I didn't get any kind of upfronts from the library itself, which is somewhat rare, not completely rare, but somewhat rare, then I am. I'm working for free. But that's okay because it is a numbers game and I want as many cues out in the system as possible so that some of them can hit, some of them can land, and I can start making royalties. But I can't think uh, I'm working for free. Now, what I'm doing is, is, is I'm releasing things into the library. I'm buying lottery tickets so that hopefully one of them pays off, right? I'm not going to I'm not gonna buy one lottery ticket, one set of numbers, and, and if it doesn't work out, then it's broken. Like the whole system is broken. But if I, write, if I buy many lottery tickets, then I, I have exponentially increased my chance. It just so happens that for most libraries, at least the most of the libraries that I work with, there's not a lot of upfront money. If it is, it's somewhat token, <laughs> but, um, but there's not a ton. So you might need to work for free if it's on spec or if you're learning the ropes or if it's a fantastic opportunity and you just want to do it. You just want to do it. Here's another thing. Here's another, here's another always that I've seen. Always get everything in writing. Always get everything in writing. And that is a dot, dot, dot asterisk because, yes, you do want to make sure that there is some documentation to support an agreement that you have made with somebody. I think that's smart. But what that looks like can absolutely depend on the relationship that you have with the person that you are making that agreement with. For example, I did an audiobook project for for someone that that I knew and I sent out a pretty dense, now that I think back, it's pretty dense cover all of my bases, like I covered all the butt, like I'm covering my butt with this contract and she got it. I mean, it was probably like five, six, seven pages long. And she got it. And she's like, wow, this is really overwhelming. You know, I, I, I just want you to, to record my audiobook. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not entering into the super long, long-term thing. And the reason, well, the, the takeaway here is that I was so wound up in covering all of my legal bases that the, the, the contract I sent her felt super impersonal to her based on the relationship that we had. And so I amended that contract and whittled it down to a one-page contract, which still essentially covered all of any, any legal issues as far as like who owns, who owns these recordings, deadlines, how much you're paying me, this is what I will be doing for you. But it didn't have like all of the uh, section eight, paragraph two, line C, force majeure type contingency legalese that shows up in so many of these contracts, which is understandable. 
if you're if you're dealing with just complete internet stranger or somebody that 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 you, you don't know well, you know, you're you're entering into business with them, you want to cover your bases. If I do a a collaboration or if I have a buyout, you know, I have a, my standard kind of contract. So it's this isn't about not using contracts. It's about approaching things like a contract with the understanding of the relationship that you have with that person. Another example, you know, publisher that I work with now, I have a contract that I signed when I signed into their library. But now when they when they put new orders in, there's not a super dense contract with every library album project. Even if there's upfront money. Now, there's an email, well, where we will say, hey, this is my understanding. Green light, yes, let me know. Because the relationship has progressed such that that is all it needs. Again, I'm not saying don't ever get anything in writing. And if you want to like take it to court, then things like emails and texts are absolutely 100% admissible in court. And if you don't know the person, then you probably want to cover your bases. But if it's somebody you know, somebody that you have a relationship with, yes, get something, but you don't have to, to, to whip out your, your, your legal Zoom chops and, 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 and completely over-contract over the situation when sometimes a text, an email, or in the case of the audiobook project, a one-page document is much more reflective of the relationship that you have. So always get everything in writing. Mm, just consider the relationship. And, and I do recognize that there is some risk involved in that. Right? And I'm not a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. But the risk reward based on the relationship. That, that's my takeaway. And maybe I just haven't gotten burned enough. Maybe I'm completely naive in this. And, and uh, I would love to hear from you if you have horror stories about, hey, I didn't, I didn't have a contract which stipulated enough. And so, and so uh, yeah, I, and you got burned. Yeah, I'd love to hear, hear that story. And maybe, again, maybe I'm just being naive. But I guess until, until I cross that bridge, I, I'm, willing, I'm willing to take that risk. Here's another never I've seen. Never take a buyout. Always insist on your back end and never take a buyout. And I can say right now that that is a never that I never apply. Because sometimes it's a loss leader. You do you a job. And if it's, if it's going to net you a bunch of money or if it's going to net you a relationship or potential work down the road, you should absolutely consider taking a buyout. I pitched my music to a trailer uh, for a, a trailer for an upcoming game, and the buyout was one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that buyout. You can have it. Another one I did for a company, uh, Disney, and it was a thousand dollar buyout. I know Disney has stupid amounts of money. I get that. But I was willing to give that away, what well, was $1,000 for the buyout for, it was, it was like a, a corporate piece for their Disney Institute brand. So it wasn't like, you know, something that was going to show up in a, in a Marvel movie or something like that. Let's manage our expectations about what this was. But uh, it was $1,000 for, for some, some corporate video work with Disney Company. And I will happily happily offer that as a buyout for a potential relationship to have that that Disney logo in my portfolio 100% 100% do that so never take a buyout mm, if it means more for your career to do that it's kind of like up there with never never give it away and never never play for free or never you know give give up your publishing share or your your writer share and all of that stuff you know, it, it really, really depends. It, it depends if it can further your career and if it means more work down the down the road, then buyouts, giving up your uh, royalty shares, those are absolutely 
negotiable. And that's what ultimately all this is, is it's, it's, it's negotiation chips that you have to bargain with. So I, I, want, I, have, I have a couple of more, and I want to talk about some production nevers and always that I've seen. I've seen one that says, never master from MIDI. Like if you're ever going to put your mastering chain, always bounce to audio and only ever master from bounced audio. And that's just, that's just not been my experience at all. That's not been my experience, especially with processing power. Uh, like, like, you know, always bounce in real time. Like, no, you don't have to do that. The computers can handle it. And so I'm here to tell you, it's totally okay to mix and master from your MIDI instruments. Now, should you bounce your instruments before you archive so that if for whatever reason down the road, you know, you don't have those plugins, but you need to get back into that session? Well, that's probably a good idea that I, I know that I am admittedly terrible at remembering to do. But that's a different conversation. Here's, a, here's another production always that I see. Always do this one thing or that one thing in a mix. If you have hip hop, always do this. If you're, uh, if you're mixing orchestral cues, always do this. Never have this on a mastering chain. Never do this. Now, there are best practices, absolutely. And each genre of, of music or each type of cue, a mood or emotion might have some best practices that go along with it. But to make an absolute out of it, I think absolutely <laughs> boxes you in. I see this with my full sale students all the time all the time. Should I always do this? If I'm mixing a hip hop cue, should I always bring the bass in first? Should I always cut the low end from a kick or whatever? It's entirely dependent on the cue itself. And so I would encourage you from the production side of things, not to get trapped into these always or never ideas in your production because in the flexibility, in the creative chaos, sometimes that happens when you're breaking these, these quote-unquote rules, you can actually end up with some very, very good results. All right, so I must admit that there are some times when it's okay to say never or always. There are some times because there are some absolutes. So, so I, 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 it would be disingenuous if I didn't leave you today without sometimes where it is okay to say never or always. All right, so here's one. All right, and these are in no particular order. Never send out a form email when you are pitching your music. Never send out a form letter. I got an email from, from somebody wanting to be on the podcast, wanting me to do an interview on the podcast and get featured. And it was so obviously a form letter. Like, luckily it was all in the same font, but it, it seemed so obvious to me that they had, they had taken their form letter and it came from a publicist and said, hi, insert name. We are so, uh, we, we really enjoy your podcast called 52 Qs. We really love what you do and we love the episodes. And then it went on for the pitch. We think our person would be a good fit for your podcast. And it was so obviously a form letter. And I mean, I get it. Publicists are sending out, you know, mass emails, hundreds, you know, of, of, of podcasters at a time, but probably they just Googled music production podcast. My name came up. And they said, okay, yeah, we'll send it. It seems tangentially related. What I wanted to do, I'm not, turns out I'm not going to, I'm not going to give it any more energy than what I'm giving it right now. What I wanted to say is, tell me about which episodes you think are, are the best. What did you enjoy about it? What did you think? Because they didn't reference any specific, any specific episodes. Parenthetically, this publicist also didn't give me any pictures, didn't send any links. Like, here's who this person is. Website, EPK, any electronic press kit, nothing. Just dude's name in an obvious form letter. And 
kind of insulting, I think, maybe, or maybe I just need to get over it, but, or maybe I've reached a level of success where, where people are going to send me form letters. But no, man, if you're going to, if you're going to pitch something, at least, at least give them the decency to write an email from scratch. So if you're pitching your music out to libraries, you owe it to the person that you are looking to create a hopefully long-term relationship with, a long-term business partnership with, you owe it to them to write an email from scratch. You can give them that. You can give them the half hour, 45 minutes it takes that shows, I know who you are. I give a damn about who you are. And you're not just an ends, uh, a means to an end for me, <clears throat> a means to an end for me. You owe it to you owe it to your libraries. That publicist owed it to me. Don't waste my time by sending me a form letter. Right? I, I'm, uh, that, clearly, that triggered me a little bit. I wasn't prepared to get that get that ranty about it. But yeah, come on now, come on. So never send out an email, uh, a, a form email, when you're pitching your music. Here's another one. Always communicate even if you're going to miss a deadline. Always communicate. If you have questions, if you don't understand something, if they're asking you to do something that you don't know how to do, always communicate. It's rarely better to ask for forgiveness than permission. If you're going to miss a deadline, I know your library might be disappointed. Your publisher it might cause a problem for them, but you will cause a bigger issue if you miss a deadline and you just no show, no call. Because that, that is damaging the relationship. That's not, that's not disappointing somebody. That is damaging the trust, the inherent trust that, that goes hand in hand when you, again, create a business partnership with someone. And so if you ghost them and they're expecting something from you and you miss a deadline for whatever reason, because we're humans and life happens, deadlines get missed. So how you handle that is to communicate. Communicate when you, when you miss your deadlines. Communicate if you're uh, running behind, if you're going to a meeting, you're running late. Send them a quick text. Running late, here's where, where I'll be there. You don't you owe them a big giant story and definitely don't make up anything. But communicate. Communicate. Always communicate. All right, and here's, here's, here's a practical one for you. Practical never. <laughs> never update your software or your operating system during a big project. Now, if, if you're a working production music composer, chances are you always have projects happening. And so that's great. Yay. You're always busy, but never update your software. If you have a giant, if you're in the middle of a big project, because something will break, Murphy's law will come into effect and something just won't work. And, and definitely never update the new operating system, I'm looking at you, Mac, never update the new operating system on the day it comes out. Ugh. I mean, I just this past weekend updated my 2014 iMac to Big Sur, which came out in 2021. All right. And so it's, it's, it's an OS behind because I think Monterey just came out. And so I'm an OS behind. And before that, I was on Mojave, which is three OSs ago. Now, now, now four, because Monterey, like, uh, and then uh, Big Sur, and then Catalina and Mojave before that. And the only reason I went on to Mojave is because High Sierra wouldn't support Logic 10.5. And that's really the motivating factor for me. I only update my OS when Logic dictates it. And it just so happened 10.7.4 with Logic had progressed enough. I really needed to update Logic. I could only do that by getting onto Big Sur. 
a lot of Mac talk for you Windows folks. Sorry about that. But never update your software. Never update your operating system. Never update your DAW. Never try to try to update if, if it's working, unless something's broken. But if it's working, then just sit on it. Find find a time where you're in between projects or you know you have a couple of days should something go wrong. And that's why I did it this past weekend. Because I had two days in a row where I knew I didn't need to be in the studio and I updating my OS. Parenthetically, it went really, really well. Updating from Mojave to Big Sur was relatively painless. Knocking on wood here. Relatively painless. A couple of, a couple of security permission issues like with my tablet, my mouse. and uh, but, but luckily, because Big Sur has been out for so long, all of the uh, plug-in manufacturers, all of the hardware folks had all ironed out all of those kinks. So it was, it was a non-issue. It was really, really, again, I'm knocking on all the wood on my desk just to make sure. All right. Another practical one, always back up your files. And I talked about this, always have a backup, always be running a time machine, whether it's cloud-based and physical-based. And I, I, I incorporate uh, both of those into my own system. And I encourage you to do the same, but always back up your files. Because again, did a whole video on that. That only needs to happen one once in your life before you realize how desperately important backups are. And then finally, I want to leave you with two, two times that you should use never and always. Never be a jerk and always be kind and easy to work with. Never be a jerk. Check your ego at the door. We're all in this together. We're all working for the same goal. Together, we are better. The folks in the industry, your publishers, they're not gatekeepers. They're not trying to keep you from succeeding. They all want the same thing. And so if something goes sideways, if, if you get you know, some feedback from a publisher and you don't understand it, or if you think your stuff is so amazing and you didn't get a placement or whatever, don't be a jerk. If you get feedback that you don't understand, that you disagree with, accept it, be kind, but be easy to work with. Because again, your publisher is on your team. They are team you. And so by making your, by helping make your music better, everybody wins. And so if you get offended when you get feedback, if something goes weird and uh, some other cue got placed and you didn't get placed, even though your cue is arguably better, just roll with it. Be kind, a little bit of kind. It costs nothing to be kind. And that's true whether you're dealing with publishers or man, whether you're letting people in in traffic. And that's, that's, that's what I try to embrace. Like if I'm in traffic and people need to merge, even though they might've roared up beside me, yeah, I'm going to get a little philosophical here. Even though somebody's roared up beside me and I'm like, that's, that's a really jerky thing to do. If I, if I like roar up to the person uh, in front of me and I insist that this person that roared up beside me who wants to edge in, they should just get in line. Just like it be a good citizen of the world and go get in line. And so I'm going to insist, I'm going to insist on, on not letting them in then I am incorporating that negative energy into myself. And I am making an already tense situation even tenser. And while I might have the, the, the brief satisfaction and the smug satisfaction that I can have of seeing that guy in the rear view, like, ha ha, jerk. That's what you get for being a jerk. You're behind me, jerk. I'm going to get to my destination three seconds faster. Well, is that worth it? Is that, is that righteous indignation in traffic, for example, is it worth it? Or what will happen if you just ease off the gas, let that person in, and now you did a nice thing for somebody? 
who, if you're lucky, you'll get a little friendly wave, but will probably never acknowledge it. And will probably, you won't receive any direct benefit and they're going to go, go on with their life and you'll never see them again. But in that moment, in that moment, in that crucible of terrible, terrible traffic coming from a guy who has to drive on I-4 between Orlando and Tampa quite frequently, which has been named the deadliest stretch of highway highway in the U.S., I have found that when I let those people in, when I back up, when I embrace kindness to those fellow human beings who are just trying to live their life, that my letting them in isn't about being nice to them. It's about being nice to myself. It's about being good to myself because when I am the jerk, when I am like Captain America, righteous indignation, I feel all in knots about it. And uh, But it's about releasing that energy and not letting it become a part of me. And since I've been doing that, traffic, it, it sucks sometimes, but traffic isn't this wound up in knots rage time. And that carries, that carries over professionally as well. Right, it's like a mind like water kind of thing. You want to absorb it and then re- re- return to equilibrium, so that you can continue to be your creative best self, whether you're in traffic or whether you're in your studio. Yeah, again, I got got a little deep there at the end. I hope that's okay. But what about you? What do you think? What do you think about never or always or any of these other? absolute terms? Are there some absolutes that you insist on? Or are there some absolutes that you think should be purged from the industry? I would absolutely love to hear from you because I always read all of the comments. (laughs) Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. But I, I really do appreciate your feedback and would love, absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be taking a listen to Results Are In by Jeff Hargrove. This is a cue written, I believe, for a recent taxi listing looking for uh, election coverage, so like for news, uh, instrumentals, and so really looking forward to checking that out. Uh, But we're going to take a quick break and listen to that on the other side. Hey, y'all. I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52Qs podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52Qs isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52Qs community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com.
was Results Are In by Jeff Hargrove. Jeff, thank you so much for sending this along. He sent this along for our week 25 search. Got a ton of love on it, and so I really, really appreciate that. I think uh, Results Are In, uh, are, was it right now? Or like, hey, the results are in, uh, in which case uh, that's cool. I like that Results Are In. Uh, first of all, I really, really enjoyed this cue, and I think you are absolutely on the mark as far as being an election, an election night type type of a cue, especially with you know we have midterms in the U.S. here coming coming around, really fantastic stinger kind of out of the gate, some kind of little bu- 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 little. Uh, and they would use just that, and so having a little four or five second stinger is so so valuable, and so I think I think we came out of the gate fantastic. Mm. I would watch some of the uh, the oops, some of the brass articulations seem to be a little a little sluggish, and I caught that a little bit later as well. We're doing good here. I feel like the snare drum, snare drum is a little too far, too far down in the mix, and it's a little reverby. Sounds like it's way, way in the back of the stage. I think this is all working. Love the sus chord, love the progression, and I love how you bring in the melody here. Um, do watch, and, and this is, you are not alone in this, watch those woodwind runs. There are a couple of tells whenever you're dealing with MIDI instruments, especially MIDI instruments which are looking to recreate uh, orchestral sounds. There are a couple of tells, and, and one of those tells is woodwind runs. It's just, those are so difficult to pull off using MIDI programming. And this is why libraries like Project Sam in, in the Symphobia series, they have these runs recorded. And so I would I would look for those, those one shots a little bit as opposed to programming your own. It's just a major scale kind of ascending. And so I think that could go a long way to helping that because once... A listener, and it kind of gets into uncanny valley territory, but once a listener kind of feels that um, that artificiality, it can be a little tough to shake. And so I would I, I would try to find a one shot from a company like or, or a sample library like Project Sam. I'm sure there are others out there. But those are the ones that I use. I think that's a great compositional choice. I love that. I love it, but it's sounding a little artificial here. And is that the same uh, range, the trumpet line? Yeah, it's the same range. And so I would, I would give that to like the horns. Save the the octave above, the high trumpets, for the next layer up. Because out, outside of the stinger, this is gonna this is probably gonna have a lot of voiceover uh, uh, over it. So you want it to set back in the mix a little bit better, and so you don't want these these really high screaming uh, trumpet parts to uh, to be blasting on top. All right, so now we're kind of going into into a breakdown territory. And those those are another thing where we have to be careful with those. I love the progression. I almost around the minute mark. Maybe go to the to the relative minor, you know. Maybe go to the sixth chord there or something. I felt like we needed a harmonic change here because it's not, it's just kind of the same progression the whole time here. Love love you giving the string and the strings sound really nice. 
But if you can make that melody work under a different progression, maybe again, kind of shifting into the minor key. And I would change up the the bass rhythm a little bit so it's not just bump, 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 but go, go a little bit dry. If you're gonna pull the energy back harmonically, take off the top melody, then we can get away with adding a little bit more rhythmic energy as it's cooking underneath it. So I'm gonna back it up to the top of this here. Bump, 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 maybe something a little bit like that. Bump, bump. So, so it just has a little bit more guiding energy. Not, not a fan of those muted trumpets. They sound really far, far back in, in like kind of the right, my, my right side there. I love how you're giving your melody you're off to the different instruments, but da -da -da, a kind of callback there. All right, so we're coming back into the primary melody. And build. And I feel like we need a little bit more powerful statement. Bum, bum, da da da, bum, ba, 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 boom, boom, da ba, ba, bum, right? Give the melody kind of by itself there, just for a moment. Because it really, it, it just feels like it's a little too samey through here. It's like it's all, it's too much the same level of energy. And did, if unless they asked for two minute, two and a half minutes, and they might have, I, 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 I'm not sure of the brief, then I would probably cut it, cut it right here. I, I would, I would ramp up to the ending right here. I don't know if we need a whole other pass through, and it doesn't really feel like it's like energetically and excitement wise. I think melodically, harmonically, all of that, the instrument choices, everything, that's all absolutely working, but it just feels like. It just feels like it's too long right now without having some somewhere else to go. And I think we need a a much much better ending. I think I think we it felt like we just kind of stumbled into it a little bit. Like we hit we hit our stinger and then and then we're done. Something like that. What do you think? And, and, I, and I actually want to play one of my cues alongside this to kind of show you to show you uh, what what I mean here. So, so here is a cue called Courage and Conviction, which was actually submitted for when CBS Sports needed a new theme for their, uh, their golf broadcast. No, I didn't land it, but I'm absolutely going to take that shot. And as I was listening to your cue, it kind of reminded me of, of this cue, um, and it has... It has everything that that we we would be looking looking to have for an election queue. All right, so check it out. We're going to dip back into that voiceover energy. With the hint, hint of melody. Harmonic 
shenanigans. Really change it up, bring in the primary melody, strip back the, the energy a little bit. With some harmonic shenanigans. All right, and now we go back into the kind of the voiceover section. All right, and now we're coming back into that section where we're gonna call the melody and really, really punch it up. So uh, extending that ener ener energy, extending that ending, when you when you come out of your melody uh, there at the end to really, really juice it up. By the way, this was my uh, this was my personal homage to Alan Silvestri as a just putting out into the universe as a thank you for uh, all the uh, the Im inf influence he's had on my own work. So for, for your cue, coming into it, like I'm not singing the right pitches, but but doing some 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 sort of like call and response between the high brass and the low brass, I think could be really really effective effective in there. But otherwise, I I, I really really enjoyed the cue. Uh, I do be careful as far as your mix goes uh, to make sure that we. Like so, with 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 so many of these orchestral samples and and the way that they're recorded in the rooms and there are all these big ensemble uh, patches, so much of like the the 500 to 800 hertz or so to 900 hertz can just really gang up where all the strings and the brass. I think it's it's baked into the way the reverb and convolution and everything works. And so I find myself having to constantly dip dip those frequencies, and I think we could probably benefit a little bit from here. And uh, otherwise, we're doing really good. Yeah, I, I would tag that. I would tag that. I think it might be the exact same thing I sang earlier, but uh, but really, really well done. Like I mentioned, this cue was submitted over at 52 Cues in our weekly feedback thread. We do threads every single week where folks can post their cues and get submissions or uh, get feedback on their cues, leave feedback for other cues, but there's so much so much else happening over at 52 Cues, like just uh, by the time you record this, it will have already happened, but I'm doing a live Q&A with Morgan McKnight, who is the executive director of the Production Music Association, and that is open to the 52 Cues members, and that is going to be just this afternoon. Really, really looking forward to that, and, and that, that Q&A is going to be posted on an upcoming episode. In fact, that will be next week's episode of the 52 Q's podcast. So uh, while, <laughs> as you're listening to this, that was actually yesterday, the the recording of that will be posted on next week episode. And so we would love to have you over at 52 Q's and uh, it, it's free to join, it's free to be a member, but we also have other subscription tiers. So if you're looking to really kind of push into the next level of your career, whether it's getting uh, interactive feedback, whether it's uh, attending workshops, whether it's, it's a, uh, open Q&A, office hours, mastermind, masterclass groups, and all of that, then check us out over at 52Qs.com. You can join up over there. You can buy merch.
merch. You can get mugs and t-shirts and all of that other business. And all of that goes to supporting the channel. So uh, once again, thank you to everybody. Thank you to su- for your support, the friends, family, and patrons. But that is going to do it for me this week. I hope you had a great week 25, and I can't wait to talk to you next week for week 26. Until then, peace. The 52 Q's podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Q's community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Q's.com.